All right. Hello, uh, everyone who's joined. Uh, so this, I, my name is Hanya Azam. I'm from um, the Lahore University of Management Sciences, Sciences in Lahore, Pakistan. And I'm visiting here in the Research in Paris program. Um, and I'm here to deliver this course as part of this fellowship. Um, so this is really, I, I should have called it a modest introduction. So I've just deliberately inserted a modest here because it's, it's really very basic. So if you're someone who already has some uh, introduction to Fukaya categories uh, prior to this, uh, this course may not be for you. Um, it, so Fukaya categories are very complicated, intricate objects, uh, which are of interest to mathematicians. And I tell you why in a bit. And um, so the reason that this is modest is that I'm not going to focus too much on the hard technical machinery. And instead, I'm going to, um, like um, in this course, I'm going to focus on a, more sim a very simple example that is surfaces, where you can do things almost combinatorially. Um, okay, so the first question is why learn about Fukai categories? So if you're interested about the mathematics that surrounds the homological mirror symmetry conjecture, then you should be bothered. So the next question is what's the homological mirror symmetry conjecture? So the homological mirror symmetry conjecture is um, an algebraic, um, so let's say, that's the homological mirror symmetry conjecture. And this is an algebraic um, version at a categorical level uh, of a phenomenon that's called mirror symmetry. So this was discovered by physicists studying string theory. So if you're uh, this is not a course on, on physics, of course, but uh, just a few words. So, so string theory conjectures that they're even smaller particles, smaller than entities, smaller than quarks called strings that propagate in a 10 dimensional space. So four dimensions is uh, um, the usual space time and six dimensions come from because they're wrapped around tightly inside uh, Calabi-Yau complex three dimensional manifolds. And those are hence six dimensional real. So these propagate in uh, six dimensions. Uh, ten, 10 dimensions. And so while studying string theory, they came across this phenomenon of mirror symmetry. And using this, they estimated, in fact, they give uh, predictions about curve counts, which were unknown, correct predictions, uh, which were unknown by mathematicians. And so that sparked a lot of interest of mathematicians. And this is, of course, one of the examples of instances where physicists were far ahead of mathematicians. And this sparked a lot of interest. And to this day, uh, you know, it's this algebraic version of uh, mirror symmetry. So calabi yaus come in pairs. So you have one, it's, it's just some manifold. And they're related by some kind of duality. And so. An algebraic version of this at the categorical level was given by Konsevich, which he announced in the ICM of 1994, and which is called the homological mirror symmetry conjecture. So which is basically an equivalence of some categories associated to one manifold and the other. So it uh, conjectures that there are there's a pair of let's say manifolds which are mirror to each other whatever that means so that two categories associated to them are equivalent so what does this mean this means that um, this offers an unexpected for mathematicians, of course, offered an unexpected bridge between symplectic and complex geometries. So, 
So the claims that the Foucault category of one manifold is equivalent to the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves over its mirror. Okay, these are just words for us for the moment and vice versa. So this is equivalent to the Foucault category of the dual. <coughs> so that's the homological mirror symmetry conjecture. So this side of the Foucault category is the language of physics is called the A model or the A side of the homological mirror symmetry and this side is called the B side or the B model and we're basically interested in as I said if you're interested in uh, in this very fascinating area of math which actually brings in a whole lot of mathematics together um, then uh, you should be interested because the Foucault categories are encoding the symplectic geometry of uh, the manifold and they form the A model side of the homological mirror symmetry conjecture. Okay, so maybe I'll come back to what these, the A model and B model is roughly after I've, uh, you know, delivered today's lecture again. So maybe we can have a look at um, the outline uh, of the course. So um, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of categories, uh, which is basically tailored to our needs. So there's a lot that I won't be talking about. So basically everything we need. Um, and then in the second part, I'll be giving you an intro to uh, Morse and floor homology theories. and Next, we'll talk about, finally, Foucault categories and, of course, the case of surfaces. And if, because we've, by this time, we would have introduced floor homology, so if time permits, we can talk about some categorification um, of the Burau representation of break groups. So this is, uh, is a slight deviation from uh, this path, path, but it could be interesting for people uh, you know, like a, for, to a wider audience, but that's, of course, if time permits. All right, so just to, uh, I'll have the references here and then we can talk about these again later. So maybe for the moment, we can start with an overview of categories from scratch. And please forgive me if this is boring for you and you are already aware of these details. All right. Okay. So we'll start with an overview of categories. I'll try to give examples uh, as much as I can. So the goal here is, so the goal is, eventual goal, is to reach somehow derived and later A infinity categories. Let's see if we can do that in today's session. Okay, so let's start with our first definition, which is that of a category. So C is a collection of objects and morphisms between those objects. So these are just denoted by, so that's a calligraphic C and that's just a C. That's the collection of objects in the category and morphisms for, for any two objects. We have an arrow between them, some map meaningful map, of course, and this F then belongs to this home set of between C and D. So you can call it a home set if you like, you can call it the set of morphisms between C and D. Um, I might be switching between the two, uh, so maybe you can remember that they're the same. All right, so those are the morphisms and there are some conditions that 
uh, we, we were able to compose morphisms. So if you take, let's say, C1, C2, C3 are objects, F and G are morphisms between them, then you can compose and this is a valid morphism too. Sorry. Okay. All right. And um, so the composition is associative. So if you have three morphisms, then you know what associative T is. You can compose them in either order and which means that you can extend the composition to uh, three or more uh, morphisms. And for any object, um, there is the identity map. So identity map in all contexts is just the identity map, which map maps each element to itself, such that when you compose the identity with F, you get F. And when you compose, so what's my F? So for any F, that is from F to, sorry, C to D. Okay, so if you compose this with D, you get F identity of uh, F is F and G of identity of C is um, whatever, G. So G is maybe a map that we can define in the other direction. Is that correct? Hmm. Okay, let me see what's G. So I s I'm sorry for this, really sorry. Happens when you try and change notation midway. So this is the same C2. This is C2, this is C2, this is C2, this is C2. Uh, also C2. And now the F and G are what you had in this picture of um, uh, the composition. Okay. All right. So it's a long definition, but all you need to remember are that you have a collection of objects, you have a collection of morphisms between the objects, and that is basically your category C. Okay. So that compositions are defined, they're associative, and there is a neutral element vis-a-vis -vis, um, morphisms. Okay. So, sorry. Let's look at some examples. So there are many examples that we're also all very familiar with. So let's look at the, the category of the set category. So it's a category of sets. So the objects are sets and the morphisms are set functions. And you know that you can always compose to and their composition is associative and of course you can use the identity map, uh, the identity function and this is a category. Um, so let's say you have A, B, blah, blah, and you have maps that are from A to B. Okay, so let's look at this category mat, which has objects that are natural numbers. So the objects are one, two, three, and so on. And the morphisms are so let's say home between M N two um, between two objects is defined as 
the set of matrices of order m cross n. Okay? So that's the morphism between two natural numbers. So if you like, you can just denote it by mn. Okay. And then something familiar from algebra is uh, the category of abelian groups. Of course, you can also think about the category of groups and a category of abelian groups. So the objects are abelian groups. G, H, blah, blah. And of course, you've guessed it right. The morphisms ought to be group homomorphisms. Etc. Okay. So likewise, you could consider here vector spaces over a field K, and here you would have vector spaces V and W, blah, blah, and morphisms would be linear transformations, and for all these you know very well, you can compose them, the composition is associative, and you have the identity element here, and you also have the identity linear transformation. All right. And of course, we could go on and on with some examples, but maybe we can, I can stop here or just give you one more. Um, all right. all right, maybe not, we can stop here. All right, so there is um, a small remark. So in category theory, there's this debate about this, this is always this discussion about um, small categories versus large categories. So, uh, so a category is, is small if the set of objects is always a set, and uh, otherwise it's it's some some class, and uh, we don't want to get into that discussion because that's not what we're um, really aiming for. Um, and so for us, or you have something that's locally small where at least the morphism uh, or morphism, the harm sets or the morphism sets are, are, are a set. Um, so, so all, let's say, categories for us are small, so we don't really need to get into this discussion. Okay, but if you're interested, uh, you can find um, some very nice um, discussions about these in any of the references. So maybe we can quickly have a look at the references. Um, so um, I've, I've really put some uh, philosophical notes there also and some very standard references. This is a relatively new one, which is abstract and concrete categories, the joy of cats. It's by Adamek, Herlich, and uh, Strecker. And um, then there's two standard references, categories in homological algebra by Pierre Shapira, and categories for the working mathematician by, by Maclean. Um, so derived categories for the working mathematician by Richard Thomas, and uh, categories for physicists by Coek, Bob Coek. These are two uh, which could be interesting for you because they're kind of philosophical notes without any technicalities or too much detail. Um, also, uh, no rigorous definitions for that matter, which is a good thing because it's those are basically philosophical notes. And then you can look at uh, Bernard Keller's notes on abelian derived categories, which comes later, and of course for A infinity. Uh, but that's much later in the lecture today. Okay, so in all of these, of course, you can find this discussion if you're interested, um, and lots of examples. All right. So maybe we can move on to 
So now we know what a category is. Maybe you already knew and lots of examples. So now we can move on to maps between categories, which are called functors. So a uh, map between categories. So you have two categories, C and D, is called a functor. If it maps objects here to objects here and morphisms here to morphisms here. So what that means is that you can start with something over here, that's an object, and it maps it to f of c, so the image is again an object of the target category. And similarly, you can start with a morphism here, and the image is a morphism in the target category D. Okay. So if you want to look at a nice picture which would really always to keep it in mind, um, sorry. So you have a, you have objects and you have a morphism between objects and f is mapping this object to f of c1 that's in objects of d and this goes to f of c2 and this map is basically the image under the functor of the morphism between c1 and c2. Okay, so this f here is basically mapping the objects to objects and the morphism to morphisms. Okay, so such that number one, f preserves compositions. I feel like these are morphisms of categories, so they're supposed to preserve structure of a category, which entails, uh, of course, compositions of maps. Um, so f of f of g is f of f and f composed with f of g, and f of identity is the identity of its image, okay? So it maps the identity map to the identity map. All right, so we can start with some easy examples. Oh. Sorry. All right, so we can start with some easy examples. So the first one is called the identity functor. So as the name suggests, it should go from the category to itself. So it just maps every object identically to itself and of course every morphism directly to and identically to itself. I think interesting. And then you have, of course, the constant functor. So let's say f d. So d is a particular object of the category in the target, uh, the target category. So d is in the objects of d. And this ends up mapping all objects to the same object. So it maps C um, to D for any 
see inside the category. Okay. So maybe we can look at some interesting examples. Maybe some are familiar to us. All right. So there is a functor which is called the forgetful functor. So it's something very useful, maybe not particularly in this context, but in general, a very useful functor. So this is, let's call it for, because it's forgetful from any category. So this is any category to the category of sets. So for example, if you, you could have this map from the category of abelian groups to the category of sets. And what this does is, as the name suggests, that it just maps any object here to its underlying set. So basically forgetting what the, whatever the structure was for that set. So in the, in the category of abelian groups, it was an abelian group and it completely forgets that and just maps it to the underlying set. And of course, the morphisms would go from uh, group homomorphisms to just the set, funct uh, the set uh, functions. Okay. All right. Um, okay. You could consider P, which is a pre-ordered set. So when I write that, you can think R with its usual order. So the objects here are, um, let's say, elements of this set. So if you're thinking about the real numbers or the real line, then these are just real numbers. And the morphisms are arrows. So let me call them A and B, etc. So our arrows from A to B given A is less than or equal to B according to whatever order we have on B. Okay? So you have arrows between these objects. Okay. And so if we take, so it's a category. So if we take two pre-ordered sets, P1 and P2, then functor between these two is essentially just an order preserving map between these sets. Okay, so that's just another example. And maybe give you another one. Then you can stop. So, so the top category is the category of topological spaces. Here objects are topological spaces. Say so X, Y, Z, blah, blah. And the morphisms are, of course, Meaningful maps here would be structure preserving or continuous maps. 
between topological spaces. So, we can look at this functor which goes from the category top to the category of abelian groups. So, what this does is that it starts get maps an object to So, this is the ith homology of x with sorry, field coefficients. Okay. So, this is just a abelian group and if you are already familiar with uh, all, um, hopefully you are familiar with what homology is. So, this just gives you an abelian group assigns to every topological space an abelian group which is the ith homology or maybe let us just take the ith homology. So, now this is consistent. Okay. So, it is called the ith homology functor. So, what does it do at the level of morphisms? If you take a morphism between two spaces, then what you get is uh, a morphism between homologies, okay? And that is uh, so it just tells you that this is indeed a functor and it is uh, functorial in the sense that it preserves compositions and maps identity to uh, the identity map on the homology. Okay, so, let us say H i preserves compositions and H i of let us say identity of x is equal to identity of h i of x. Okay. Okay. All right. So, with each category say if we are in the abelian category or if we are in let us say the topological category, we are familiar with a notion of isomorphism, um, which means that the two objects considering their nature are the same. So, for the topological category of course, we have the notion of a homeomorphism. Uh, for abelian uh, category, we have the notion of uh, isomorphism and so on. So, what, how do you, so we have already learnt how to um, understand maps between uh, two categories. We know what a morphism is between two categories. Now, we want to know what an isomorphism is or so the notion of being uh, the same uh, in terms of their nature. And that is what we want to say next. So, there is a notion of isomorphism in category theory, um, but um, Right, so before I do that, I just wanted to, sorry, I missed to add this nice fact. So, what do you want to say is that um, if you have a functor between two categories and, sorry, 
if you have a map between two objects, which is an isomorphism. What does that mean? That means that it's, it's a morphism in category C, which is uh, also bijective, so it's an isomorphism. Um, in, let's say, C, then the corresponding map in D under this functor is an isomorphism in D. Okay. So, so functors map isomorphisms to isomorphisms. But the converse is not true. Uh, so if you're familiar with uh, homology theory or homology functor, you know that if you have a, a homeomorphism between two spaces, then you've got an isomorphism between their homology groups. But if you have isomorphic homology groups, it does not necessarily mean that the two spaces are the same or homeomorphic. So the converse is not true. Um, and it can be quickly verified from this last example. OK. So the question we want to answer is what is a befitting notion of being the same in categories. So that's the question. So there is a notion of of isomorphisms and there is a notion of equivalence of categories. So this means they are the same as usual and this means that they are essentially the same. So isomorphism is a, a very, is, is a rigid notion in, at the level of categories and uh, nevertheless useful, uh, but equivalence is, is more, um, uh, is more useful because it's less rigid than the notion of isomorphisms. And um, if you remember, I told you the homological mirror symmetry conjecture, uh, it predicts an equivalence, an equivalence, not an isomorphism, between two certain, certain two categories associated to mirror pairs. Okay, so this is important, but we'll also define this. So let's start with the first definition, That's, that is of isomorphism. So a functor f between two categories is called an isomorphism if there exists a functor in the reverse direction from D to C such that G of F is identity of C and F of G is identity of D. Okay, so let's see, I usually mess up these. So G of F is identity of C, that's right. So that's this composition and that's the other composition in this direction. Okay. All right. So, if such 
and isomorphism exists as usual as in the case of uh, familiar structures um, uh, we say C and D are isomorphic as categories okay Examples. So for any commutative ring R, so R modules, R mod is the category of left R modules. is isomorphic to mod R, which is the category of right R modules. And this is, this is something we learned for a commutative ring in uh, our first course on, on ring theory, is that these two are, uh, there's a way of going from a left R module to a right R module. In fact, they're, they're the same, not essentially the same, they're really the same. Okay. So, but there, uh, there are two categories which are naturally uh, isomorphic. All right, and the other one is considering Z modules or Z modules. So this is the category of Z modules. And this is isomorphic to the category of abelian groups. Okay. All right, so maybe we can turn to our definition of um, equivalence so you will see in this definition of equivalence you do not have like a, a functor going in the different in the other direction so that uh, the composition is exactly identity um, but before that I need to give you some definitions. So, a functor f from c to d is called an embedding. If f is injective on objects so it's called faithful if for any F and G from let's say a home set between C1 and C2 to objects in the category C, their images F of F and F of G are 
distinct. So this is basically just saying, not part of the definition, it says that F is injective on the home sets. So for example, if I look at the forgetful functor from a billion groups to the category of sets, so this one is faithful. So if you take two uh, morphisms, they get mapped to two distinct uh, set functions in the target category, okay? All right. And finally, this functor is called full. If for any H in the home set in the target category. There exists a G, a morphism in the source category such that F of G H. Okay. So what this is saying is that F restricted to morphisms is surjective. So when a full functor maps objects from one category to the other, it does not create more morphisms than there were in the original category. So for example, or like for a non-example, uh, the forgetful functor is faithful, but it's not full. And the reason is that if you take these maps, that are mo group homomorphisms in the initial category, then they get mapped to, uh, for any two given objects, the two objects get mapped to the set category as two s the two underlying sets of those objects. And between the two underlying sets, you can have plenty of uh, set functions which are not group homomorphisms. So, uh, so you end up creating more morphisms in the target category than there were originally between those two objects in uh, or in the home set in the abelian category, which is the source, okay. All right. Um, so maybe I can give you an example here. So I gave you a non-example, but I can give you an example. So F from a billion groups to groups. So, um, so this is a full functor because, well, um, well, it's also an embedding, and it's a full functor because you take any morphism here, you get the same morphism back. So you're not creating any more morphisms between two chosen, let's say a billion groups G and H, okay? So F is just one morphism, you could have many between the two. And of course, in the target category, they remain the same. Is there after all just uh, group homomorphisms? So finally, we're in a position to define um, 
the equivalence of categories. So f from C to D is called an equivalence of categories if f is full, it's faithful and isomorphism dense. So, what does that mean? That if you want to remember it, it means essentially not surjective, but essentially surjective. And say in a moment what that means. So, this means that for any D belonging to objects in the target category, there exists a C belonging to objects in the original category such that F maps that C or the image of that C is not equal isomorphic to D. Okay? So, that is what isomorphism dense means. Okay. So, okay. And if this is the case, we call C and or we say C and D are equivalent. Okay. So, that at least explains some part of our original um, uh, motivation for, for doing all of this is to unpack uh, the this only a little tiny bit of the homological mirror symmetry conjecture statement um, is just we have basically just unpacked what the equivalence bit is between the two categories. Okay. So, we have 5 minutes left. Should we take a break or should I continue or maybe I can give examples and then we can take a break. All right. Um, So, the first one is so I am looking at the category of let us say metric spaces so metric spaces are the objects here and the morphisms are just continuous maps between those metric spaces. Okay. And this is equivalent to the category of topological spaces, but I will put a tiny m here, which says of course, not all of them but only the meterizable ones. So, this is um, let us say the category of meterizable topological spaces okay. and the morphisms are again here continuous maps and you can think about it a little bit like a small exercise to see what uh, to, to really um, um, well, come to an agreement with this uh, statement that they, they are equivalent. 
Okay, so in fact, I can tell you exactly what the functor is. So it maps any metric space to the metric induced topological space. It's, they have the same uh, underlying set. So a small exercise would be to check this is not an isomorphism. So not really check, but just to see whether you know you can find a, a morphism. Uh, sorry, a functor going in the other direction so that the compositions churn out identity maps or not. Okay. So when I when I write exercise, it doesn't necessarily mean it's it's something very simple. <laughs> Um, it is also maybe uh, sometimes just to, to little spend some time think about it. Okay, pre-ordered sets. We saw that these they themselves are uh, can be treated as categories. Um, they can be equivalent as categories. without being isomorphic so you remember that the functor between two pre-ordered sets as a category was were just um, uh, order preserving maps between the two sets um, okay yeah, maybe this is a good time to stop or and then we can um, okay so maybe I can ask if there are any questions or okay so we have about five or ten minutes all right so I just have one small definition um, to give you before we move on to uh, certain type of categories. So the definition is that of a subcategory. So a category, let's call it C prime, is a subcategory of C if the following are satisfied. So objects of um, C prime are subsets of objects of C. The home sets in C prime are subsets of home sets in C, of course, between the same objects. So you have C1, C2, because objects are either included one in the other, C1, C2. And thirdly, the identity, let's say, in C prime of map morphism of an object is the same as the identity morphism of that object in the category C. And of course, this is true for all objects C in C prime. Okay. All right. So. Um, a subcategory is called a full subcategory if a part, okay, so if, so if A holds and C holds, but the, if B holds, um, with an equality. So you don't just have an inclusion, rather you have an equality between the home sets. Okay. So, so a, a full uh, subcategory is fully uh, specified by its objects. Um, and maybe we can Look at an example. 
of some familiar structure. So groups, this is a full subcategory of of monoids. Uh, so this is the category of monoids. So this is where you've relaxed the condition of existence of the inverse for every object. So you have a group operation and um, you also have associative, an associative binary operation which also admits identity and um, here you also require the inverses. And This is the category of semi-groups. So semi-groups are um, one step down, so they do not admit identity elements. Or they may have, okay, so they may have a left identity or a right identity, but they do not have like a, a left and right identity, uh, which is the case for a unique identity, left and right unique identity in the case of monoids or groups. Okay, so but what I want to say here is that this is a non-full subcategory, so it's just a subcategory. Okay, so just some fact which I found I just a nice thing to state is that C prime is a full subcategory of C if and only if the inclusion functor is so what's the inclusion functor it just maps objects to objects and so by inclusion and the same goes for the home sets so the home sets here including the home sets here so this is an equivalence so that's saying a lot that's saying that it's full it's faithful and it's isomorphism dense uh, and this is equivalent to saying that this inclusion functor is isomorphism dense. Okay, so that's just saying that to to check this, all you need to check is whether it this is isomorphism dense. And then if this is true, then C prime is going to be a full subcategory of uh, C. Okay. So let me give you a quick example. <sighs> okay, so I need to say so C S, let me write C S K. This is a full subcategory of C. So C is any uh, category and uh, so this is, so what is CSK? It's called the skeleton of C. So this contains, um, um, let's say isomorphism classes so the objects here are isomorphism classes of objects in C. So which means that um, no two distinct objects in this category can be uh, can be isomorphic to each other as objects. Okay, what else? Uh, okay, and the home. Uh, Home, the home sets are, are uh, home sets between isomorphism classes of objects between C. Okay, so that's the skeleton. And what I wanted to say, yeah, is that this category 
is a full subcategory of C. This holds true for any. Um, so for instance, uh, you, you may have to look this up a little bit. So the set of ordinal numbers, oh, sorry, not ordinal, I should say cardinal numbers. is a skeleton for the category set, okay, which means that it's a full subcategory of set, okay. Um, so next what you want to do is I want to move on to um, from you know, just arbitrary categories, I want to give them more structure so that we can do more. And I want to define next is abelian categories. So you will see that now things are going to be a, li a little uh, on the verge of sloppy uh, because I don't want to give too much dense uh, information, uh, technical information, um, but I hope to relay what, you know, it entails and really what we need out of this. Okay, so let's look at the first definition. Um, so the first definition is that of a Z category. So a category such that the home sets between any two objects in C are a billion groups and um, all composition maps are bilinear. Um, so what does it mean for composition maps? It's, a, it's the same, you take a homomorphism from x to y and then you compose it with a homomorphism which is from y to z and that gives you, the composition gives you a homomorphism between x and z. Okay. Um, and um, so what do, what do we have here? Uh, the abelian groups, I, I need to quickly tell you what the group uh, law is here. So if you take two objects x and y and you take the diagonal map which is from x to descends any x to xx, that's a diagonal of x. So. Uh, you have two maps, F and G, inside um, X and Y. Then you can take this sum, direct sum of maps, F and G. Both are from X to Y, X to Y. And take the co-diagonal on Y. And this map, F plus G is this composition, okay? So it's really determined by the category C. Anyway, so this is called a Z category. So the next thing is, so a Z category, you should think, um, as rings with several objects. Okay. So you see there's a way to define addition and there was there were compositions that were already there. So you can think think of them as rings with many uh, with several objects. 
and to an additive category is a, so now I'm defining the additive category is a Z category. So which means that these two conditions hold with one um, a zero object. And what does this do? So if you take homes from the zero object to any other object, you get zero. And if you take homes from x to the zero object, you get zero. So if you want to think, you can think in terms of a group, let's say. If you take um, the trivial group and you take homomorphisms from the trivial group to any group, you'll just get the trivial homomorphisms, homomorphism and also uh, vice versa. I mean, if you if you change change the direction of arrows, you get the same. So this is true for all objects. So let me say for all x belonging to objects of C, fancy C, and two for any x y, which are objects of C, there exists an x cross y which is an object of C endowed with morphisms that are projections onto X and Y, which are universal in some sense. So just usual way of defining universal properties in homological algebra, you have a map which commutes for, you know, every pair. So I'll, I'll just say that in a second. So it's a endowed with projection maps. Which are universal in that the following map is let's say uh, let's say I so let me just write down the draw the picture so this is p x this is p y um, here you have some object u and a map that's h. So it's another object in, in your category. And these are the compositions of the two maps, G. So let me draw them with a color. So G is uh, this. And F is this composition. Okay. So this map commutes. Uh, sorry, this diagram commutes for any u and h. So this is equivalent to saying that this map from h to the pair px is bijective. Okay, so you take it if this makes any sense to you. Otherwise, we just move on. Okay, and there's a similar thing for the co-product that you can draw. So let me instead just give you an example. So the category mod R. So R is a ring. This is the category of right R modules is an additive category. And so are all of its full subcategories, such as you see, you have a module over, you have modules over R, some of them are free, some are not free. So 
let me call the free modules it's free R. So this is the category of free R write modules and let's call this M mod with a small m or the category of finitely presented modules over r okay right modules okay so if this doesn't make sense to you then maybe you can just stick with this uh, category of modules over r and it's an example of an additive category okay so now we want to define what's an abelian category so i can erase this side of the word and define an abelian category Right, so this is not really a definition, it's kind of a definition. So an abelian category is an additive category. See, such that each morphism of C admits a kernel and a co kernel, and that this F bar that I'm going to draw is invertible. for each morphism f. So let me draw. So between two objects, let's say C1 and C2, we have the morphism f. This has a kernel, this has a co-kernel. And here we have a map that's called the co-image of F and a map which is included in the target is the image of F. So if you like you can call this, so let me call it star. So this is, if it helps you can call it the kernel of this map star. And if I can call this, I don't know, spiral, then the co-image is the co-kernel of this spiral, okay? And I wanted to say what the F bar is. So F bar is this map between the co-image and the image. Okay, so this, this map is, is bijective. So this has some consequences. Um, so before I give you examples, let me define. So basic Basically, what we really need is that your our morphism that our category admits kernels or morphisms admit kernels and co kernels. Okay, so this means that you can talk about sequences, complexes, uh, chain complexes, exact sequences, short exact sequences, stuff like that. So that's why you need to be in the setting of an abelian category. Okay. So this has some consequences which we can mention. Maybe we can process the uh, quasi-definition better. 
Okay. So this definition implies the following. So first of all, um, in an abelian category, a morphism is invertible if and only if course, if it admits kernels and co-kernels, you can write it in terms of kernels and co-kernels, or you can say that this is trivial and this is trivial. So if and only if, it is a monomorphism, you know, a morphism which is injective, and an epimorphism, one that is surjective. Okay. Um, so the definition also implies that we can talk about one well, okay so I should say complexes shorter that sequences sequences blah blah and of course their cohomology very important because cohomology everywhere in the world is defined in terms of a kernel in an image and if it doesn't admit kernels and co-kernels and images, you can't take these quotients, then um, we cannot talk about this. Okay, and we can define, um, I don't know, um, exact functors. Okay, so this is the usual, uh, in the usual sense. Um, so, uh, but I'm not going to write it down, but in the usual sense of homological algebra, um, um, it's left exact if it pre preserves this kind of short exact sequences, and it's um, right exact if it preserves this kind of uh, short exact sequences, and uh, it's exact if it preserves both. All right, so examples, if I take, the very, these are two very important classes, I'll say in a minute why, uh, examples, uh, classes of uh, abelian categories. So if R is a ring, then you take modules over R, this is an abelian category. And two, if you take X to be a topological space, then SHX is the category of sheaves of abelian groups on X. Okay. So, in fact, uh, I mentioned that these are very, so if you know about sheaves, uh, well and good, otherwise we can just skip this for the moment. Um, so these two classes of examples are very important because these were the two classes that Groth and Dick wanted, so they wanted to unify them using some cohomology theory and it was basically these two classes that he wanted to unify. And so these are these are important, uh, which is why he was studying or defining, studying, not defining, studying a billion categories for the sake of these two, initially, of course. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, I have some time. I think it should be enough finish our category module. Okay. So what do I want to do next? I want to go to um, the sloppy part of my overview 
and I want to learn how to um, let me put this as a subsection and talk about derived categories. So again, I'm trying to unpack the D in uh, the HMS picture. So you remember, we had a D We've already unpacked this. For a mirror pair of manifolds, and there was an, uh, uh, the Foucault category here, it's a category, and there was a D next to it. And here again, you had the category of coherent shields on the mirror and the D next to it. So we're trying to uh, unpack the D as much as we can. Okay, so the pipeline is the following. So you start with A, that's an abelian category. Uh, now we kind of know what that what that means. So basically this admits let's say short exact sequences and from here we write we go to the category of complexes over okay so we're already familiar uh, with this um, if you know, uh, if, or if you've ever come across the notion of a graded vector space, um, uh, it's, it's a complex over a category, the category of vector spaces. So each, so you have something of the sort. You have, let's say, that's a collection of objects with some maps. Let me call this a D. So it has some maps. It's a collection of objects. Let's say, let's say some. Um, I don't know. Let's start from zero to C one to C two. Blah blah. Here you have D zero, D one, D two, and so on. Okay. So this is a complex. If the D is composed with If you compose any two consecutive maps, you get uh, the zero morphism. Okay, what does that mean? That means in general, if I compose the, 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 the subsequent one with the previous one, I get the zero morphism. Okay, that, that makes it a complex. So this is a complex over A. Why do you say over A? This means that uh, the C's or the CI are objects in A, okay? And with that, of course, these morphisms are morphisms between those objects, but they're special in the sense that they square to zero, okay? So you look at the category of complexes over A, all right? So this thing is called a differential. This is D is a differential. Um, and of course, if you if you know the Durham complex uh, of forms, then uh, this is should be familiar. Then you look at forms, the zero forms are going to be functions, one forms are the differentials, so that's the exterior derivative for you, those are one forms, and then you take the derivative again. Um, at least of the ones that lie in the image over here, you'll get a zero. Well, otherwise, you'll get something that's a two form and so on. Okay, so we started with an abelian category, we got to the category of complexes over A, and now we're going to go to the, the homotopy category of A. So this is called 
the homotopy category of A that we started out with. So, let me try and write things somewhere. I need space. So, maybe I can erase this top part so that I can say the about morphism. So, okay. So, um, I have already said what the objects are. So, these are the objects. So, the morphisms here are so f dot from a c dot to a, yeah, a c dot to a d dot. Okay. So, what is a c dot? c dot is a complex like this and d dot is a complex like this, but with its own differential and uh, you have a map uh, between the two uh, complexes. Okay. And so, here you take objects are the same as in C A, okay, the same complexes over A and you take um, the morphisms uh, to be classes of morphisms modulo null homotopic ones. So, maybe I, I can say this later what this means a little bit later and just finish the pipeline and then from here you go to this derived category. So, now you see that the same D appearing here. So, that is the derived category. There is a way of going from here to here by some sort of uh, localization. So, you remember in the case of rings, uh, you localize a ring by formally inverting elements. Yeah? So, you just attach to a ring the inverses of these elements and that is localization at that, uh, at that element. So, similarly, this is a categorical localization. Okay. So, and this is what you call the derived category of A. All right. So, there is something that I need to unpack for you is very quickly what I meant by a null homotopic by being uh, classes of morphisms. So, this means that you consider these classes. So, any two morphisms in this class they differ by a null homotopic morphism. So, two or in other words, two morphisms are not in the same class if they do not differ by a null homotopic morphism. Okay. So, if you just for the sake of completion, maybe I can quickly say what null homotopic means. Oops. Okay, so you take two complexes and B is another one. So, this is a differential for B. And you have a morphism 
from A dot to B dot. What does that mean? That means that the level of each um, degree component of the complex, you have a map which is indexed by the same degree. So this is Fn minus 1, this one is Fn, and this one is Fn plus 1. Okay. So um, if you consider this, um, okay, right. So if you take a family of maps, let me take, so that's a family of maps it's called Hn, and you have n plus 1, and you have other maps like this. If you take this family of maps from a n to b, one cohomological, cohomological degree less, um, and you look at these compositions. So I'm looking at this composition. So that's um, uh, yeah, that's h n. That's h n composed with d b n minus one. And you look at the other one. which is in this direction, sorry, where is it, in this direction, so I should have chosen a better color, it's in this direction, this is um, uh, Hn plus 1 composed with Dna, okay, so if you add these two, And this equals F, then you say that F is non homotopic. So this isn't really revealing much, but hey, yeah, this is just to make it a little self contained, doesn't reveal much. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, this is just to say so that we have at least our pipeline is so we know what the pipeline is, okay. So you start with this abelian category, you go to the category of complexes, you go to its homotopy category, and then you localize in some sense to uh, get the derived category. Okay. All right. So, so very quickly, I want to say something about, yeah, I just want to come to, um, Okay, so just a reminder of, um, yeah, so you have a complex, so if you take, um, if you take any, so for example, if I take, um, if I take C dot, D dot, or maybe I should put a dot upstairs, so just to be consistent. So if I take a C dot and a D dot, uh, this is a complex over some category. So think groups, rings, whatever. Then. I can apply the cohomology functor to this, which is just going to give me the cohomology of the complex. So let me call it, uh, all right, so it's the nth cohomology. And what is this? It's again a member of the same category, right? If you start with the complex uh, complexes of groups, then you take the homology, you get a group. If you start with rings, you get a ring uh, or a group anyways. So what I want to say is the following. So the homology functor is let's say, from starts from the category of complexes 
and gives you an, an object of the category itself. Yes. So, um, what do I want to say? Um, right, induces a functor on the homotopy category. So, H A to A. Okay. So, what I want to say next is so, I'll keep this picture intact, so we can refer to this. Um, right, so I want to give you the following definition. So, uh, morphism, uh, let's say a chain of, oh, let's, let's say a complex, a morphism of complexes. So let me give it a name. Let me call it, I don't know, F from C dot, C dot to D dot is called uh, quasi-isomorphism. If the induced map in cohomology is an isomorphism. So at the chain level it's not an isomorphism but when you go down to or you apply the homology functor so it descends to an isomorphism at the level of cohomology. Okay so that's what you call a quasi isomorphism of complexes and so why is this important? This is important because I'm going to localize the class of these quasi-isomorphisms. So, let me just, I mean, this is probably not even good notation, but uh, the right notation, but just to get the point across. So, let me denote by sigma, the, or maybe not sigma, I'll be using sigma later. So, what do I call this? It's called a Z, the class of all quasi, okay, let me just call it a set of all quasi isomorphisms. Okay, we just define those and then again, this is a way of taking a quotient of a category. So given an abelian category A, the derived category is defined by formally inverting all quasi-isomorphisms, okay. So this doesn't help much, I agree, but this is just to say, so you localize in some sense, uh, just like in the case of, of rings, you know, you localize, okay. So, it's just a way of taking a quotient in the categorical sense. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, what happens is that homotopic um, maps that are homotopic to each other, they get to define the same, because it's coming from the homotopy category, they get to define the same 
morphism in the derived category. Okay. All right. So maybe we can stop here. I was going to give you a definition of the infinity category, but I think there's no point in giving the, the, the general definition. And instead, we can focus on that in the context of the Fugai category when the time comes. Okay. So, <clears throat> what I want you to remember from this is that we've so far um, we've so far unpacked what equivalence of categories means, and these categories are basically derived categories. So we don't know what this is yet. This, uh, at least, is out of the scope of these lectures, but we don't know what these categories are. But we have somehow made some sense of the derived D for derived. Okay, so um, it's a, it's a long haul, but uh, it's worth it. At least it keeps you at peace that you know what the D means. Okay, um, all right. So again, these are uh, very nice references. The first references. Uh, especially very reader friendly. So, uh, you'll find lots of examples. In fact, I've taken lots of my examples from here too. Um, and these are uh, very nice philosophical notes that you know you can really refer to. And these are, of course, uh, classical, I mean, I mean, proper classical. I mean, this is also a proper reference, but I, I didn't mean to say that, but, but they're nice, uh, really rigorous references, all of these. Um, okay. So, what's up next? Up next is Morse theory in folklore homology, cohomology, and I need that to define morphisms in the Fukaya category. So, just to be able to make sense of morphisms in this category, we need to know what floor homology is. Okay. And we'll motivate that starting from all the way from Morse theory, and then we'll define that as some sort of a generalization of Morse theory. <coughs> and that will help us make sense of morphisms in the Fukaya category later. Okay, so that's all for today.